Linda joined us while, while we were while you were answering that question, and she actually had a question from one of the other Lindas on the forum, and it related to uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which we talked about a little bit ago. So maybe Linda, if you could go ahead and read that question uh, from the other Linda. Sure, absolutely. Uh, the question is, and I felt like this was related um, when Vicky and Tom were talking about the internet and consciousness. The question is, will AI guy develop consciousness because the computer we make gets so low entropy that it is a natural progression? Or will the computer get so sophisticated that a free will awareness unit can inhabit it? Okay, the, the answer there is is kind of yes to the last one. The computer gets sophisticated at FWAU can inhabit it, but inhabit it is not really quite right. It's rather to say that the computer gets so sophisticated that that computer develops consciousness. It's not that you have some consciousness somewhere that's, you know, bopping around out there in consciousness land and says, oh, look, you know, a new house, and it jumps into the computer and that's its new home. That's kind of the way the word inhabit comes across to me, but it's it's not like you inhabit a house. The computer actually develops consciousness based on the environment and the constraints of that computer. If it has all the ingredients to support consciousness, then it develops consciousness, and that consciousness will just develop up to the level of the constraints of the computer, just like those... Uh, you know, the, the game of life that uh, Conway uh, did. You know, they can only go to a point where they kind of run into their constraints. And that's the same way it is with consciousness in a computer, and that's the same way it is with consciousness within us. You know, we, we go to the point from, from our viewpoint here in, in physical reality, you know, we have constraints because it's hard for us to see a picture that's, you know, that's very big because we're, we're so consumed in this little picture. And we run into those constraints a lot. But we will, uh, you know, we have lesser constraints in other reality frames. So the computer uh, can become conscious, but it's not really an inhabit. And it's not something that uh, it gets low entropy. Therefore, um, you know, it, it uh, becomes conscious. I guess you ha it has to have the ability to evolve to lower entropy on its own. And that's what lets consciousness develop in it. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, I'm looking at the questions here, and I'm having a hard time bouncing to the next one, so maybe we should uh, just change it up a little. Uh, Uni had a question related to healing, and uh, I believe he mentioned mental disorders. It's question number two off of his list. Yeah, the question is about um, mental disorders in relation to healing. Um, First, uh, I don't, I know, I don't know if we can agree on maybe two types of causes, uh, and in PMR-related cause and a more PMR-related cause um, to a mental disorder. And the PMR-related uh, cause would be more, well, it could be like uh, genetics, brain chemistry, trauma, torture, and so forth. And my question is then, how would one go about healing these type of uh, these different types of mental disorders, and what is the different difference between healing a mental sickness versus healing a bodily injury or disease? Okay, well the two are related. Um, yes, there are two uh, two different uh, kinds of of. Um, I don't know how we say it, the causes, I guess, two causal strains, two different causal lines that end up being labeled as mental illness. One of them actually is a mental illness, I guess, and that's, that's where you have brain chemistry or some such, some such uh, biological dysfunction that causes the brain not to function properly. And, and the other is that uh, the person is simply uh, connected to the larger system in such a way that they hear voices or see things or whatever, and that uh, um, that's labeled mental illness. I mean, you're mentally ill by definition if you vary very far from the norm. So, you know, the people who get to make up these rules obviously are the are the ones who find themselves to be average, to tend to define the norm. And then if you get too far away from this normal behavior, then you are mentally ill. 
Now, if everybody saw voices and, uh, I mean, heard voices and saw pictures, then that would be normal, and people who didn't do that would be called mentally ill. So mental illness is a relative, a relative term that has to do with uh, how you uh, compare to what's average. So that's the first thing. A mental illness is not really an absolute state. It's just a relative state compared to, a, to an average. And I suspect as that average changes, which it probably has, if the average right now as far as mental uh, acuity goes is probably much different than it was you know, 10,000 years ago because our environment and the things we do and the way we think and our patterns are so different. But in any case... So that's the thing about mental illness, but it, it can be either, either one of those, but they're related. You see, what the brain does is that the brain provides the constraints for what the consciousness in that body that has that brain can do. So if you, uh, if you're, you know, if you have brain damage, whether it's brain chemistry or whether, uh, you know, you take a real hard knock on the head and you get, you know, brain damage, physical, um, damage to your brain, then you're limited in what you can do. You may lose some of your memory. You may change your personality. You may begin to hear those voices and, and pictures. Things will change. You may uh, not any longer be able to walk, or maybe you can only use uh, one side of your body, you know, like after a stroke. You know, maybe your right, you know, your, your right and left uh, are, are affected such that you can move your right side of the body, but not the left. So brain damage uh, basically, is that the brain is the is the constraint. It is an embodiment of the constraints that define what the virtual body can do, can perceive. How can it work? And the whole body is like that. It's not just the brain. The physical body is a is a constraint on what the entity can do. So your physical body constrains you, say, from leaping 20 feet into the air. Our bodies won't support that. We've not, you know, we're not built that way. We have too much weight and too little muscle to do those kinds of things. Um, so the, the body is, is, our, is our constraint, which defines our interaction, which defines our perception. You see, so that's what the brain there is for. Now, the brain doesn't... doesn't um, Obviously, it doesn't create consciousness. You see, the, the brain is, is an artifact of the rule set. The brain is physical. It's a virtual brain, but it's a, it's a physical thing. When we, when we look at it from the, from the perspective of a physical reality, you have a physical brain. And that physical brain, the constraints it has are the constraints that are laid on by the rule set. That brain had to evolve, and it had to revolve, evolve in the physical reality. So it requires a certain number of neurotransmitters, and if you don't have enough, it doesn't work right. It requires a certain amount of fluids and glucose and all sorts of things, synapses. And so the brain is made up of all this stuff that has physically evolved. Therefore, it represents the rule set, the physics, the biology, the rule set of our reality. And we are then constrained by that brain and body according to the rule set. So that's really the purpose of that brain. It's not that that brain uh, gives us our uh, awareness and consciousness. That brain is a limitation so that we cannot, um, we cannot uh, move or perceive beyond what the rule set allows given what we've, you know, what we've evolved, what we have in that physical reality. So it ties us to a physical experience. That's, the, that's kind of the function of that brain. Now, when that brain doesn't work right, then it can give us hallucinations, it can make us fearful, it can do all sorts of things. Because what you experience as consciousness has to have a physical analog to support it in the brain because we can't do or perceive or be anything that our physical rule set, our biology, doesn't allow, doesn't support. Remember in uh, some of my earlier talks, I talked about the, uh, you know, the sheep and that the, um, you know, the sheep who uh, were found to be uh, moral, the, the older uh, sheep were taking care of the lambs from other mothers who were gone, I don't know, shipped off, killed, whatever. And the, other, uh, the older sheep then, I think it was the other female sheep, would take those, those baby sheep in and take care of them, nurse them, raise them, that sort of thing. And that was a big deal because you have sheep being 
being moral, you know, and moral is just considered a, you know, a thing that people do. And how, you know, how could that happen? Well, um, the idea was they, they, of course, they find a sheep being moral and what do they do? They, they want to kill it and study its brain. So they do that. They study the brain and they find a little chunk of the brain that's, that's there that is similar to the same place where we have chunks of brain where they have uh, found that that's the center of moral judgment, moral uh, choices. So then they say, well, okay, what happened was that the brain, the physical brain evolved that little chunk there and that allowed the sheep to become moral because now they had the brain to support it. Well, it's not like that. The sheep became moral. They were pulling themselves up by their bootstraps like anybody else. They got to the point where moral behavior was characteristic of them. And because of that moral behavior, their brain had to change, modify itself in order to justify it physically by the rule set, because you can't have the sheep doing something that the rule set doesn't support. That's called paranormal. And we know there are no such things as paranormal sheep. So their brain had to, uh, had to uh, modify itself to support what the being is doing. So as you grow up, as you make choices and lower your entropy, your physical system, your brain and your physical system actually modifies itself and changes in order to support the who you are now relative to the who you were before. Now, it's, it's done in subtle ways that uh, like they pulled out Albert Einstein's brain to study it after he died, and they just found out it looked like everybody else's. It was an ordinary brain. Um, more or less, it wasn't, uh, a, it, didn't, it wasn't obviously a genius brain. So these changes are very subtle and have to do with things that we don't understand about brains. But that's the case. So the, the consciousness leads and the, and the body follows. That's the way... Uh, that's the way that works. So have I have I gone far enough afield that uh, we've we've lost lost the original thread? Or is that, uh, Uni, do you do you want to come back with any further question there? I think that was a great um, theoretical foundation for the question. Um, but it's just um, that we rarely hear about healers trying to heal a mental sickness. Um, well, that's, yeah. you can heal mental things and you can heal attitudes and you can change people's uh, perceptions of things, um, but you don't heal them in the same way. The way you heal, uh, you know, somebody's broken arm or something is different. You go there and you use your intent to increase the probability that future states they will be healthier, that their arm will heal and grow back together and be straight and strong. The way you deal with mental things, it's, you, don't, you don't work at that at the physical level generally unless you know that it has a physical cause. If let's say they don't have enough serotonin in their body to create sufficient neurotransmitters, then you may work on the pineal gland that creates the uh, serotonin that controls, it's the regulating uh, circuit, if you will, for the, for the uh, neurotransmitters. So in, in that case, you can work on that part of the brain to uh, make it more functional. You know there's a biochemical issue there. But mostly, you do the opposite. You go to the person and you talk with them. You, have a, you, you help them understand what they're seeing. If they're seeing images and things, you help explain what that is. You calm their fears. You deal with it in that way. And then as they get a grip, as they, uh, as they calm and as they can kind of deal with their reality more productively, more normally, that's, that's defined that way, then they will actually modify their own body chemistry to meet that change in their, in their intent. So that's the other way to approach it, is to approach it not that you're trying to get rid of their images or their voices, but you're trying to help them deal effectively with those images and voices, not be run frightened by them, not see them as disease and an awful thing, but to deal with what they have to deal with. So if what they have to deal with is that uh, they have anger problems, then you need to talk to them about anger and anger management and taking responsibility for that anger and what they can do about it. And they will get less angry. And as they get less angry, that brain chemistry starts to modify itself. 
So there's two ways to approach the problem. And most people don't, uh, don't work on mental problems. And the reason they don't is because most mental, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of mental problems are the person gets, gets so wound up into the problem and the medical establishment helps them get wound up. They get told that they're mentally ill or they're sick and they, and they, that's a good excuse. And it gets into kind of a negative spiral to where they are so convinced of that and so uh, given up to that diagnosis that they no longer have the ability to think in a bigger picture and consider it from another angle, which makes them very, very hard to deal with. In other words, they, they basically get obsessed with their illness, obsessed with being mentally ill, obsessed with their pictures, and uh, withdraw into that obsession. And when you have a consciousness that's focused that tightly shut, it is very, very hard to uh, affect it in any way. Because when you heal... It's not that you're bullying somebody into seeing things your way. You have to work with them, and they have to be able to open to it. You, you, don't, um, you don't force people into things that uh, they don't want. And you have someone that's, a, that's obsessed, and that obsession, like I say, is often not just natural to them, but their society, their friends and family, and their, their doctors uh, reinforce that obsession and it becomes a hard thing to deal with. But it can be dealt with successfully. It's not that you can't fix those sorts of things, but they, they can be very difficult, and they're not nearly as easy to fix as something like, uh, you know, a bleeding ulcer. Yeah, that, about, um, that answered the question. William had, had a uh, brain-related question that came up while you were, while you were talking, Tom. Uh, William, did you want to ask that? Uh, yeah, I had uh, one or two brain-related questions. So, first of all, Tom, um, I understand what you're saying when, when you say that, uh, well, the brain follows the mind rather than, uh, well, the, your brain, your physical brain follows your uh, NPMR evolution, your, uh, if you lower your entropy, your brain will evolve uh, based on that. But what if... Um, people were to open your brain today, hopefully, uh, after you pass. <laughs> uh, yeah, not before, that, that wouldn't <laughs> No, that would hurt a bit. But uh, would, they, would they see uh, new parts that they wouldn't find in your average guy? It depends on how, uh, how much detail they could go to, the level mm. at which they could uh, make that examination. I would say probably not. But that would be because we know very little of the brain and how it functions and how it works. You know, we we are still uh, almost at the, you know, at the very caveman level of understanding uh, the the brain and how it how it works and how it functions. We've got a little bit of it down. We've kind of mapped functions to various places. Uh, we have no idea how all that information is stored. We have no idea how it's retrieved. We have no idea how the processing works. We really have no idea how it creates, creates all of the emotions and feelings and, and uh, how things get connected. Uh, you know, we do things that computers have a very hard time doing. You know, we, we look at patterns and we can take a, um, a bunch of seemingly unrelated patterns and find, uh, find connections that allow us to take new inventive steps. And computers have a very, very hard time at doing things like that. Uh, so we don't really understand how, you know, we, we pattern our, our models for the brain on computers because we, we see it as basically a computational device. But we really have a very rudimentary understanding of how it works. So I would guess that no, just like with Einstein. Einstein had some things in his brain too that were different than the average brain, but it wasn't visible. They, they didn't have a good enough understanding of where and how to look. And I don't think it would be a whole lot different uh, with mine, but that depends mm. on who's is looking it, and how much they know. Yeah, is it is it a matter of we don't have the actual instruments to measure that yet, or we're actually looking at it the wrong way? Probably both. Mm. Probably both. Those two tend to go together. As you get better instruments, you tend to understand things better and start looking at it in a in, in a in a better way. But uh, 
the brain is uh, is really kind of the. I mean, we talk about it as kind of the transducer between the the consciousness and the physical body, but it's not really that at all. It's the it's the constraint. You know, we're in a virtual reality, and uh, the virtual reality is just data, and this brain in this virtual reality that's just data <laughs> is the is the set of constraints that must that applies the rule set of biology in this virtual reality to our actions to what we can do. So, so they, they, they are here just for as a kind of um, consistency, right? I mean, yeah, it's uh, our, yeah, we have to be consistent with the rule set. You know, we can't suddenly leap 20 feet in the air and run faster than a speeding bullet. So we have to abide by our rule set, our physics. You know, we, we can't levitate, that sort of thing in our, in our physics. Now, it doesn't mean we can't we can't hack the system otherwise in, in a consciousness space, but not in the physical space. In the physical space, uh, if we hack the system here, it has to abide by the, the, the uh, psi uncertainty principle. We can't hack it in such a way that it makes it obvious that it's been hacked. So that's, yeah, so the brain is, uh, is, our, is what ties us to the physical rule set in this virtual reality. So it's like an interface or a filter. So there's all the things we might do, but the only ones we're allowed to do as physical uh, avatars in this in this virtual reality game are the things that the rule set allows us to do and those are all embodied in the body and in the brain because these things had to evolve under that rule set in the physical reality frame okay and uh, how quickly uh, do the change the physical changes in the brain happen um, based on your um, personal progress, very, like, very, uh, very quickly. As you begin to to change the the nature of your being, the things that you can think and do, then the the brain begins to change with them. So it's a uh, it's pretty close to a to a. It's not exactly, I guess, a real time you know process, but pretty close to it. It's not. There's not a large lag there. Mm -hmm. Because uh, yeah, it's just for me. It's curious because we. It's curious that we, if the, the the change is so quickly that uh, our science today cannot really pick up on that. I mean, that might come back to the problem we mentioned earlier of not being able to measure it or looking at the mm -hmm. wrong place. But it's it's yeah, it's still amazing. We're not. Uh, we haven't figured. Uh, we haven't even noticed that uh, on a more no. mainstream. No, we don't notice that. Matter of fact, we're just beginning to notice something I wrote in my books back in 2003 that uh, evolution doesn't necessarily have to take, you know, a million years or mm, thousands of years. Leaps. Evolution evolution can uh, can uh, be changed. The genetic structure can be changed in a in a uh, you know, in a lifetime. So it's it's and now they, I've just read something, uh, oh, I don't know, about six or seven months ago where they're beginning to, to see that, where the experiences that people have actually do then modify the genetic structure that they have that they pass on to their children. So because of what they experienced in their lifetime, they can actually pass on different uh, quality in their structure to their offspring. And before it was thought that, that those changes only took place either with... with uh, you know, major, um, what do you call it, when, uh, major uh, statistical fluctuation. That's a, um, I don't know, uh, what do you call it? Words escape me. That's a problem when you're over 65. You know, you have these <laughs> issues with words. Anyhow, it, um, you, you either have one of those kind of random changes or it takes thousands and thousands of years with lots of pressure. You, you, know? you mean mutation? Yeah, mutation. Yeah. Right, but I'm not talking about a mutation or you know anything taking that long but just in a in a single lifetime you can change the nature of your genetic material you're changing that dna so then you pass a different kind of uh, dna onto your to your kids and it has to do with what you learned and what you didn't learn you know uh, it, it depends on uh, on uh, the growth of that individual so that evolution even biological evolution works at a much faster level than, than we thought possible, and now they're beginning to get that. That's that's actually become, it's probably uh, almost well known now. By the time I see things like that, they've been around for a while, and uh, they they do understand that 
that not only does the DNA provide the code to tell you, you know, what, how to be, but you modify that code as you go. So it's much more dynamic than we think then. Much more dynamic than we think. But now a change between individuals or a few individuals, of course, has to accumulate a lot of uh, value before it can actually change a species, you see. So it's not like all of those changes then change the whole human, you know, DNA that doesn't. It just, it just creates some differences, you know, in a line. And those, those differences then can be, can be taken away or added to by the next group of people. If they do things that, that uh, encourage it and enforce it, then that'll, that'll be stronger. And uh, if they don't, then that'll be weaker. So there's lots of things that we, that we get that are basically physically based. And I say physically based. Again, the physical is, the, is kind of the, the blueprint of what's allowed by the rule set in this virtual reality. And, and uh, much of our personality, much of the way we are, a lot of things that, that uh, scientists, psychologists think we develop strictly from environmental connections are probably about 75% hardwired and about you know, 25% environmental. We get a lot more out of our physical system out of our constraints that we uh, we have with our body than, than people think and we can change those constraints much more easily than people think mm, that's, that's really interesting <laughs> uh, Vicky did you have a question um, yeah I was just sort of as you were saying that um, it was like well if you can pass things in your DNA along to your kids it would presumably only be things that you've learnt prior to having the kids rather than something that you've absorbed or learnt or experienced after the actual having of the kids event sort of thing? One would, one would think that and that's probably true but you know in, in my experience I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I don't like to make any kind of uh, this is the way it always has to work rules because uh, there's, there's a lot going on here that uh, isn't physical because we are not really a physical, you know, this is not really a physical reality. We just think it is. It just appears that way. It's really a virtual reality. Things can happen as long as they don't obviously break the rule set. All kinds of strange things can happen. You probably know, if you know many people who, um, oh, adopted children or who, um, let's say uh, two people get married and they each have children and the children are very young and you find out that uh, A's children, A marries B, and A's children begin to take on a lot of the characteristics of B. You know, their uh, you know their hair suddenly gets curly like B's. You know, and other things. And and pretty soon it's 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 almost obvious that they really look like, act like, and have a lot of the genetic um, things that that B has. And they're they're not B's child at all. You know, they're they're A's from a from a, a previous uh, marriage. Say, these things happen and. To say that, well, that's just impossible, can't happen that way, I, I hardly ever like to go there because I, the times that I have gone there in the past where I thought I knew what I was talking about, you know, you, you find out later that it's, that it's not necessarily true. We live in a statistical reality, and as long as those statistics don't, don't run afoul of the science uncertainty principle, all kinds of things can happen. Things can happen that uh, have no physical explanation because this isn't really a physical reality. Now, that's how you can, like, hack the system. You know, you can modify things. You can change things. You can modify your own DNA. You can modify your physical constraints. But you can't do it in a way that you uh, violate the science certainty principle. But still, all sorts of things can happen. Now, do they normally happen that way? No, but there's, there's vast room in the margins for all sorts of unusual things to violate our sense of physical causality just because we don't really live in a physical reality. We live in a, in a probabilistic virtual reality. I think I read somewhere where there have been studies done of, of um, things that particular groups of animals like populations, local populations of animals had learned and that it had somehow, that learning had somehow been um, passed on to a wider, you know, the wider species sort of thing. And I can't mm -hmm. remember, like, in particular what those learning things might have been, but it kind of brings up that same kind of um, ability 
within the larger system yeah. to, to do that kind of thing that you just think it couldn't be possible, but it's happening. <laughs> yeah, there were, there's a term called the, the hundredth monkey experiments that uh, have to do with uh, some monkeys learning things that they shouldn't actually have been able to learn. You know, as, as they come into a new situation, they can pick up on kind of the rules and, and uh, information within that new system without them ever having the, you know, without them having ever been there. They kind of come in already educated. And that's the same thing. Yes, we communicate, we share data. Our intent, you see, can modify the probabilities as far as what happens next. That future probability uh, that exists before we actualize it with choices, we can modify the probabilities in that future probability uh, reality with our intent. So things that, that uh, as long as we don't obviously violate the rule set here, there's much that we can do. And we can pass information in ways that are, that are uh, um, paranormal. Paranormal just means outside of what we know. And uh, that, can, that can happen. That's why the paranormal exists. There's a lot of paranormal stuff going on here because our reality is not buttoned down and physical. And we do not have to abide by the by the uh, causality all the time. There are some constraints, but uh, we can, we have a lot of leeway, things that we can change just with our intents in this reality frame. So that's why I kind of hesitate to say, oh yeah, that's the way it is and it can't be any other way because <laughs> intent can change that and do some things that uh, probably are, are one in a hundred million of probability by physical, you know, uh, causality, but they happen just the same. Mm, amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Linda, uh, the other, well, Linda with a Y, had a comment about something you just mentioned. Well, thank you, Justin. I heard that the guy who wrote that about the 100th monkey later recanted and admitted that he was wrong and that there was no such thing as the 100th monkey effect. And I just heard that yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to um, check it out. So... I just wanted well, to jump in there. Yeah, I haven't, I hadn't heard that, but you know, it could be, and there could be all sorts of reasons for it. You know, lots of times you will study something and it'll be that way. And then uh, you study it again and it's not, doesn't necessarily mean your first study was wrong. It just means that it's different and it changed. The circumstances were different. Um, the, in, the attitudes and mindset of the experimenters do affect the outcome of the experiment. And it's, it's very difficult to, um, to get around that that problem, we try. That's why we do double and triple blind, you know, um, research, because we know that that's that the experimenter's mindset affects the results. But uh, in science, in hard science, it does the same way. You know, when somebody's uh, you know studying uh, the way a particle resonates or something, the thoughts of the experimenters do have an effect within the uncertainty that's allowed by the rule set of how the results come out. Now, physics usually deals with things with very small uncertainty, so they don't notice it quite as much, whereas the social sciences deal with things with great uncertainty, so they notice it. It's very obvious, but it works the same way in a, in a, a physics experiment. The results of that experiment uh, can vary within the uncertainty of the experiment based upon the intents of the experimenters and other people involved in it, and once it happens, once that, once, it, uh, once that experiment is done and it creates a, a fact, if you will, then we're stuck with that fact. And that fact may have come out two or three different ways if there was enough uncertainty. But then once it's come out a way and it's a fact, then uh, the more people do that and, rep and uh, you know, replicate. Create, the same, create the same thing, replicate it, yeah, then the, the more solid that fact becomes. And pretty soon it's very difficult to do anything else. But when that was done the first few times, there may have been one of three or four different ways that it could have come out. So it's, a, it's an interesting world that we live in that way. But the 100th monkey thing, I don't really know a whole lot about it. I've just heard it, it talked about as uh, an experiment with monkeys where the monkeys seem to know information that, uh, you know, paranormally based on uh, things that, the, that uh, the various groups where they come from knew. And I can see they may have done that experiment and it didn't work out. I can also see somebody in the... Uh, uh, scientific fields getting a huge amount of pressure to uh, recant something that uh, isn't uh, supported by the status quo and 
mm-hmm. and the normal way of doing things. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why that might have happened, and um, it's that's not the only example of that sort of thing. I mean, that, that's many of us have have had experiences where we we suddenly know the right thing at the right time. Mm-hmm. And we have no real knowing of where that came from. Well, that's kind of the hundredth monkey, you know, in a personal subjective experience. But those things happen, happen a lot. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Vicky, did you want to go ahead and ask uh, your question number four? It's basically, we sort of touched on it again earlier, and it's about why perhaps in this PMR experience, everything is so obscure to us in terms of purpose, you know, from the beginning um, and why we don't understand why we're here and we don't remember past lives, past experience because I know that when I'm trying to, you know, do something, if I understand the history or whatever, I can often do a better job. So I'm just sort of wondering if perhaps why that might not happen here is maybe it's, you know, designed that way. It's in the rule set. It's an AUM experiment to see how it might affect, you know, growing consciousness quality with those constraints or maybe that we might not use the information that we might, that, you know, that sort of information well or maybe if we did know it then it would keep us locked in some sort of preconceived ideas of um, what we needed to do or, you know, ideas about the larger reality that we couldn't grow out of. So I'm just wondering maybe what the purpose of, I guess, the dumbness of us, you know, (laughs) at least initially, might be. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, the last two things you said, which was, uh, uh, you know, perhaps that uh, most of us wouldn't use that information properly if we knew. I'd say, yes, that's true. And this, the, that was the next to the last. And the last one is, uh, well, maybe it's more effective if we don't know because then we uh, can potentially lose preconceived ideas from past experiences. That's true, too. But there's a couple of basic things that that uh, are kind of more fundamental. Basically, it's not about the intellect. It's not about what you know. It's not about the facts. Having all the information at the intellectual level would just confuse you and interfere with your ability to learn through experience in the here and now. Okay, where the way we learn in this in this uh, classroom we're in is we have to. We have to do, we experience, and we react. And how we react is a, is a uh, reflection of our intent. And then we look at that intent and it produces feedback. And we react, then we change perhaps because of the feedback if, we're, if we want to change. So it's this sort of system that doesn't have really anything to do with intellectual knowledge. It's all done, it's all worked out at the being level. Okay. You know how people say that uh, a good way to grow is to live in the present moment. You know, don't live in the past. Don't live in the future. Just be present in the present moment. Well, why is that effective? And if anyone's done that, they realize it is very effective in, uh, in uh, raising your, you know, the size of your decision space and, and getting a bigger picture, just living in the present moment. Well, the reason that's effective is because when you're doing that, you're living more closely at the being level. You're not using your intellect to run your life. You're just being in the moment. Living at the being level is like suddenly being awake at the being level. Now you can choose to be more cogently, more wholly, instead of just reacting to your intellect and ego and fear and all the rest of that stuff that uh, takes place at that, at that level. So that's why that's such a valuable thing, living in the present moment. It's being at the being level. So one of the reasons that we don't get all that knowledge and all that information is it's just not useful. It would just get in the way. It would confuse us tremendously to have – we'd be second-guessing everything. Well, we should do this. No, we should do it this way because last time we did it that way and this happened. So on and on and on. The chatter would never quit if you had all of that to, to, to get through. What you need to do is just be in the present moment. Let all the intellectual stuff go and be and try to improve the quality with which you be in all of your choices within all of your decision space. So that's kind of the recipe, the, uh, the knowledge is not pertinent. Now there's another point too. Imagine that you kept all that knowledge. If you had all that knowledge, 
your head would be so full of things and a fact if you remembered your past lives, if you remembered the last, you know, 6,000 uh, children that you had, you know, and the last, you know, 3,000 spouses and all the heart rendering things, you know, when you were eaten by that saber toothed tiger, you know, and when it ate your baby and you had all of these things to deal with because they were all current memories and emotions. Well, what would you do with that? You see, that would be not workable. You need to let all of that go. That stuff would just, it would trap you in, an, in kind of an unending uh, shuffle through the data with your intellect. And that's not where the action is. The action is at the being level. Matter of fact, it's that intellect that, that uh, drags us to such a slow pace most of the time. It's that intellect is where the, the ego chatter and the fear are running around a great deal that affect us. If we would just live in the present moment, we would eventually more easily, I should say, get over those, those fears and grow out of that, that ego and if we got out of the chatter. That's what we do when we meditate. We learn how to quiet the chatter, how to let all that uh, data go and just live kind of in the void for a moment. In the void means you, you've gotten rid of all the information. You're just at peace with yourself as a part of existence. And that's where the learning gets, gets best. So no, all that information you see would be, a, would be a drag. It wouldn't be a help at all. You think that if you came in here and you realized what you were doing and the bad things you did last time and the new things you have to go, you could work on it. But it's not, it's not really that way. We mostly don't drive our being level with our intellectual level. Usually the other way around. We, we interact at the being level and then we justify everything with our intellect. So that, that's why it just, uh, it would be a burden to have all that. Yeah. I think I'm still kind of coming to grips with the, the doing versus the being. Um, I sort of start to understand it more, but it's intellectually understanding it rather than kind of mm -hmm. experiencing it. And that's, you know, a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. That's a difficult thing to, 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 uh, to get because this reality frame by the nature of the rule set tells us and, and kind of trains us that if you want to change something, you have to do something. And the sense of just being doesn't seem to feel like it could ever accomplish anything, you know, because here we, we affect things by changing things. You know, it's about energy. You know, you set something on fire, you change it. If you just don't do anything to it, then it just stays the same. So we've, we've got this sense that doing is required. And in fact, the doing tends to get in the way. If when the doing becomes so much a part of what we're focused on, then it gets in the way. There's nothing wrong with doing. We have to do things. You can't live in this, this physical reality frame without doing and doing efficiently and doing well. All those things are, it's not that you give up on worrying about doing. You have to, you have to do things and do them well. But you don't want to run your life. You don't want to... Um, to try to change the quality of your being by doing that doesn't that doesn't work the the doing works fine if you're if you're manipulating physical things in physical matter if you're talking about consciousness then doing is a three dimensional physical reality concept not a not a uh, not a consciousness concept consciousness concept is being so we, we try to take the physical and, and use it to move the non-physical, and it doesn't work for us. And most of us coming out of Western culture are very addicted to doing. And we don't know what to do is the problem. When we want to, when we want to change you know, us at the basic level, I get these questions all the time. You know, I really want to go out of body, but I don't know what to do. I've got all this fear, but I don't know what to do, you know, and we have to have something to do and we don't know what to do. And that leaves us feeling, oh, you know, kind of unfulfilled and, and uh, restless and it's just not working for me because you're trying to force it to work through the intellect. And that's the way we approach everything. And we need to let that intellect go and work more at the being level. That's the whole point of meditation really is to let go of the intellect, let go of the noise. Let go of the judgments and the chatter and the, and the ego and, the, and all that superfluous stuff so that you can just be and nothing else. So, you know, and people spend decades learning just to do that. 
that's how hard it is. It's very hard to uh, to let go of the intellect. Yeah, I'm I'm getting that more and more as um, as I learn more. I understand that the learning has no real value in terms of changing me. No, it doesn't um, change you. It gives yeah, you it just, options, though. It, it gives you it, understanding. Yeah. It gives yeah. you things that, well, I see. I need to do this. And if all you do is, is consider it intellectually, it'll never help you. But if that helps you, then be differently because you now see different choices. Before, you only had this many choices. You, you learn something in the intellect. What the intellect's good for is it's good for giving you more choices. And now you can maybe make better choices using that intellect. So the intellect's a good tool. We don't want to get rid of it. We just want to tame it so that it, it works for us rather than we become obsessed with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Tom, uh, Linda was just typing uh, something about maybe talking a little bit more about reducing uh, our ego. Uh, Linda, if you want, do you have something specific that you, you wanted to mention or maybe just... No, I just was wondering, because Tom mentions it a lot, you know, uh, expanding your consciousness, spiritual growth, reducing your ego. Um, I was just looking for, again, with the do, specific steps, things we can do to reduce the ego. Well, the thing you can do is kind of use your intellect rather than just to justify what you end up doing because of your fears and, and ego. Um, use your intellect to try to see additional choices. In other words, um, someone uh, does something to you that's unpleasant, you know, they, uh, no, I don't know, you know, that whatever would be unpleasant to you, you know, that somebody breaks into your car or somebody steps on your foot or does something and you can, you have choices as to how you react to that. You can get angry, you can get mad, you can go get your gun, you know, you can do all kinds of, of various reactions to it. And most people, don't realize that they've got so many choices because they just do what they do, which is a reflection of who they are at the being level. So they just get mad or they get uh, upset or they cry or they run away, whatever it is. And they don't see that there's really a lot of other choices there. Now the intellect feel, can help you there. They don't feel they're in control of how they can react to that. No, they're just being right. They're just being reactive rather than saying, well, you know, it's up to me whether I get angry. Nobody can make me angry but mm -hmm. me. I'm the one that accepts anger. I don't have to accept anger. I can just let that go. Even if it was an intentional slight or an intentional hurt, I can deal with it in more, you know, in a lot of different ways. And just knowing that you have other choices is, in, is by definition, that increases your decision space, increases the size of your reality. And and knowing those other choices, then you can start to evaluate those choices. Well, which of these choices, you know, moves me toward love? Which of these choices moves me away from ego? And then to try to make those choices. So that's the intellect actually being used in a very effective, a very effective way. So how do you do that? You realize that every tiny little choice you make is important. And you make hundreds of choices every day. And those choices have to mostly do with interaction with other people but sometimes they're just interaction with yourself you know the way you uh, you uh, see yourself may be in need of of changing it could be internal but mostly it's external is what shows these things up so when you meet the person on the street when you you know talk to your coworkers, when you whatever you know deal with your neighbors all of those are opportunities to express an intent based on caring on compassion, on, on uh, somebody else rather than about yourself, meeting your needs. So if you do that, if you just are aware all the time, see, that's what it, living in the moment does. When you live in the moment, you're just aware of what's happening now. And when you're aware of that, you suddenly realize you've got choices and how you react to sorts of things. And you don't want to react with anger. You don't want to react with, you know, with violence. You don't want to react that way. There's, you don't have to. There are other choices. And the only way that you can make those other choices is you have to get rid of ego because it's the ego that uh, limits your choices. It's your fear that limits your choices. So if you start seeing other choices, you're starting to push your ego and fear away. So that's, that's one thing you can do is just become aware of what you're doing, 
why you're doing it, what's your motivation for the way you feel all the time, particularly in those times where you feel in a more extreme way, you know, where you feel more anger or more joy. What is the motivation? How did you get to that point? Why did you decide to act and feel the way you act and feel? And if you let your intellect like, uh, kind of wander around those sorts of musings, you will see ego. You'll see, well, the reason I acted like that is it's about me. They did something, you know, well, what about me? You know, what does this do to me? And that's why I'm angry because you took my stuff and you see that it's all your sentences are, are in terms of me and my. And you can see that and you can say, hmm, most everything I do, it's focused on me. Maybe I need to uh, look at it from another perspective. So those are the kinds of things you can do. Live in the moment, inspect your motivation for even the most trivial things, particularly when you're into, into uh, stronger feeling space. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Tom, uh, William had a, a question related to doing versus being and uh, choices, so I'll pass it over to him and he can ask that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that really makes sense, but uh, when you were discussing this, I thought about... Uh, you, you, you mentioned it's about being uh, rather than doing. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have choices, uh, but by, by being more evil, if you want to, you have more choices that open uh, that are, uh, present uh, themselves to you. But if you don't actually act upon these choices, then you don't evolve, right? Um, well, yes, your, your evolution has to do with the quality of the choices you make. You make quality choices, then you can increase the quality of your consciousness. That's what. That's how you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Is you, every little, every little uh, choice you make that's on the side of more of better quality uh, helps, helps you evolve. And every little choice you make that's on the side of ego and fear helps you de-evolve. So it's the sum total of all the choices depends on, on how you change. So I mean, you still have to, to to do right <laughs> you have to make the way. choice right yeah. that's why you're you're hearing this reality to make the choices and see and see what happens get the feedback what does that do you know does it uh, does it move you toward less fear or more fear does it move you toward you know less uh, self focused or more and that's you know that's the beauty of this place is yes we do do that's what we're here we're here to to make choices and to do so that i guess that that's the right kind of do then <laughs> it's not the yeah, doing that's the that's, right kind yeah that's like the right I kind go, of do by yeah. uh, something or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you have to do, right? It would not be good, as a contrast, it would not, I would say, it would not be a good choice to decide, well, I don't need to do anything. I'm going to cross my legs in a lotus position and, uh, you know, put in an IV and be fed intravenously, you know, and never open yeah. my eyes or move or ever see anybody. I'm going to dig a pit or go in a cave and meditate 24-7. That, I don't think, would be a good way to learn, because so you're cutting that, yourself off from all those opportunities to interact and learn. That would be a very sterile, unenriched environment. So, yes, we do have to do. That's what we're here. We do. We interact. When I say doing is not, is not what we should <laughs> – doing is not what we should do. What I'm saying is, is doing is not a prescription for, yeah. for growing the quality of your consciousness. You can't – that's the intellect does the doing. But yes, we're here to do. We're here to interact. We're here to connect and live and enjoy and you know laugh and cry and play. That's what we're here for, and we're supposed to learn something from all of it. So you you, you can't really grow just by practicing meditation, for instance. This is just no, no, it's not just, good. Now I've seen people who have done that, and I've known some people uh, who sometimes have trouble because they did that. What happens is that you grow very unevenly. If you grow, if, if all you do is meditate, then you get very, very good at meditating. You may be very good at healing and, and uh, you know, getting around in the larger reality system, but you don't get very good at that with your ego because there's nothing to test it. There's nothing to try it out. It's just you and your meditation. So the ego sits there and, and doesn't... Uh, you know, you don't lose it. You're gaining skills. You're a good meditator. You can do all kinds of things in a larger reality. But when somebody comes to your cave and kicks dirt in your face, it makes you mad. 
you know, and you holler and scream and throw a fit because you haven't yet dealt with that part of your existence, you see. So you grow, but you grow very unevenly. And then you have an even worse problem because now here you are kind of advanced in some ways and retarded in others. And that's a much more difficult platform to work from than it is if you're more more aware of that. (laughs) Yeah, you're more aware of it. You realize where it is you need to be and you realize that you're not there and all of this ego, then you get distraught and you get upset because with your, you know, it's a, it's a much harder thing when you're out of balance like that. Better to kind of all grow up all the parts of you at the same time than to have some way out in front of others. So you can't just meditate your way out of all of this. I mean, doesn't to me it doesn't really make sense when when people say they they just spend uh, almost their entire day meditating. I mean, uh, I guess it's fine as a as a tool, right? To to learn to get more in touch with yes. yourself. Then then you have. To, I mean, the the you're already good at doing this NP NPMR NPMR stuff uh, when you're not embodied, right? So it's kind of right. counterproductive. I agree with you. It's counterproductive and it's actually harmful to your long-term growth because you get out of balance and then that out of balance part slows your growth. It becomes very uh, exasperating and upsetting, which then tends to generate more fear and ego and feelings of failure. And you see it has a you you end up in a downward kind of spiral with it. So it it gets to be a, a, a problem actually to be out of balance in your growth. Yes, you need, you're here to, to experience here. That's why you're in PMR, to experience it, interact with it, and learn from it. And the richer and, and more real and more deep you deal with it and interact with it, the more you're likely to learn. You can learn things just meditating, but that's just a piece of, the, piece of it. And you don't want to get one piece way out in front of the other. So it's a matter of balance. You know, some people do just the opposite. They never meditate. They never consider any big thoughts. You know, they never think anything other than, you know, what they see on TV, you know, and those people are out of balance. It's all physical. It's all touch and feel. They don't have any mental space. They don't have, they have no awareness of being conscious. They just are and do and they react to things. And that's out of balance in one extreme. And then there's others, like you say, that want to meditate all day, every day. And their way out of balance. You have to be able to do both. You have to be not just right brain or left brain. You need to be whole brain. You need to do it both. If you only work on your analytical parts and your very left brain, well, that leaves you unbalanced with your holistic parts. And if you're just holistic and you can't find your way home because you, you know, you you can't uh, think linearly enough to, you know, to get a taxi and tell them where you live, then you're not doing very well either. You need both, and the key is to is to uh, stay right balanced, balanced in your in your growth. Yes, makes perfect sense. Thank you. 